My heart was bouncing out of my chest from 8.30 in the morning until I left at 5.30 at night. I think I walked across the street and did two shots of Jack Daniels immediately. And I'm like, oh, so the rally's over, right? And my buddy was like, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> like, this thing is going to the moon. As like, far as the AI trend goes right now, do you think it's a long-term trend or do you think it's going to be, you know, kind of a fad? Now, if you're bent on the downside of oil, you're screwed. Now they have enough in storage for a normal winter, but if we have a cold winter again this year, they don't have, you know, when, once things go and start relying on more wind and solar, there'll be some kind of a peaceful period and then there'll be a complete natural disaster that happens where people are out of power for so long that people die. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Growth and Gains podcast. Today we have a very special guest who I promised a grandiose intro, an intro so good he could frame it on his fridge for his wife and kids. Now, although he may be an absolute rock star, I've been known to be musically challenged, but that's not gonna stop me from giving my best. So I come to you today with some slam poetry. Now introducing an energy expert, a macro analyst too, at the helm of TG Macro, letting price action be his cue. From his early days on the trading floor and the lessons he drew, now bullishly trading breakouts with risk reward setups his view. Ladies and gentlemen, lend me your ear for stories from a man who holds no fear. In the world of markets, he's a pioneer. Here, introducing Tony Greer. What, what would you say is like the most exciting trade you've made or most exciting story from being on the floor? Well, I'll tell you the most exciting uh, story I have from being on the floor was when I worked on the floor for Goldman Sachs, I was in gold options. I was in the gold options pit and that was because we had uh, some massive positions on and it was worth having our own broker in the gold options pit to react to any flow that came in because I would kind of know what positions we had and what were good buys and good sales and stuff. So I was in the ring as an options broker with a badge and that's a much slower moving auction market than spot gold, right? The, right. the spot gold price. And as it turns out, one day, the regular Goldman Sachs gold clerk called in sick, couldn't make it in. And he's like the best gold clerk on the floor of the exchange or anywhere. His name is Mark Tillet. Uh, his badge was Ski. And he was the coolest dude. And he was out that day. And it just happened to be a day <clears throat> that they pivoted me around and stuck me in the gold futures pit. So now... I went from, you know, trading a couple thousand contracts over the course of a day to on this particular day, it was an absolutely batshit crazy day in gold. And I wound up trading 30,000 spot contracts before the day was over, oh, yeah. which is, you know, and if you know, yeah, if you know the procedure of, an, uh, of a futures trade on the floor, you know, it would be, you know, me bidding or offering or you bidding or offering and then me making eye contact with you, trading on a price, agreeing with how many contracts we trade, having a time for that trade, an opposing badge and what you did. And so I'm not that experienced of a broker and I get thrown into the cash pit as Goldman Sachs's broker, and I've got thousands of contracts to execute that day because we were unwinding an ARB that we had cash against the board where that day we were selling futures all day and the market was rallying. So I went from having this sort of day where I could be kind of, you know, relaxed and composed about everything I was doing to, hey, TG, get over there. We need your futures ring. And I was like, oh man, I know this is going to be busier now. And I know that gold's up on the day. So this could be, you know, a really crazy day. And as it turns out, I made it through the day unscathed, traded over 30,000 contracts, which is like a huge day for any futures trader. Had no out trades, knock on wood. But I, my heart was bouncing out of my chest from 8.30 in the morning until I left at 5.30 at night because I had so many trades that I had to make sure cleared. 
and everything like that. And uh, I think I walked across the street and did two shots of Jack Daniels immediately, <laughs> uh, you know, just, just, to, just to try to reframe myself, you know, and, and kind of shape myself out of, you know, having people bark at me and having to have each piece of data be absolutely correct um, over the course of, you know, six to eight hours. So anyway, that, that was just one thing that came to mind. And you guys were like old floor stories. I was like, oh man, how about that day? You know, but I'm glad I made it through. And it's just one of those things that's, you know, part of your baptism, you know, in, in becoming a, a floor trader or any kind of trader. So that was kind of fun. I have others, but I'm sure there's other stuff you want to talk about. Yeah. And I mean, that's wild. Do you, do you, I, I do want to ask, do you ever, do you ever miss those days? Do you ever look fond, fondly oh. on them up on the floor? To me, open outcry is everything, right? I, I, I don't, I, I hate electronic trading. You know, I, I, yeah, like open outcry is, you know, the thing about open outcry, you know, if, if, when you, if, there's something about the trust and the brotherhood on the floor and with what goes on with futures trading. Right. If you go to a store and you buy something expensive, you gotta give them your credit card, right? Your credit card company has all your information. It's that you will you you can look a guy in the eye and have a transaction that's four hundred, you know, a half a billion dollars in an instant, right? And it's like, hey, 80 bid for 500 sold, bought them, right? You know, that's five, 50,000 ounces of gold just traded right there. You know what I mean? That's like enormous amount of money. And it was on me trusting this other broker, we have a set of rules. There's procedure for everything. And when that, when open outcry is going smoothly, it's the purest form of trading there is. Right now we've got this electronic trading that I call the wood chipper, right? Bullshit because nobody knows how to bid an offer anymore and nobody will just bid at a price. Everybody is becomes a buyer at any price. You know, so there's no more art going into execution. And I say that because I, you know, I did a lot of equity execution as a broker and you would get an order from a customer and he'd say, yeah, buy, buy me 50,000 shares of this stock up to $44 with a $44 top. Right. And you'd say, okay, call the guy up. I bought 10,000 shares. It's 44 bid. And he'd be like, okay, take a 44 and a half top. Right. So he's giving you another 50 cents room to, to get to 50,000 shares. Okay, buy some more stock. And now now the market's rallying and everything's rallying and it's 44 and three quarters. You call a guy up, hey, it's 44 and three quarters up to 44 and a half. I bought 15,000 shares. You know, you're trying to get to 50. Guy would say, okay, take a 45 top. And you're like, do you even give a shit? Where, where like, why are you, why are you even giving me a top on this? If we're just going to chase this thing up to any single price, at least tell me that, you know, between here and this price, when you give me the order that you'll own it, you know, so back in the day, people were much, were much more careful with large pieces of merchandise, right? Brokers knew what had to be traded and they knew in their head what their, what size their client wanted to execute. And when the opportunity came out on the floor, they could participate. And now everything, you know, you have to trade against Jim Simons every time, you know, you put a trade in the equity market because his algos are there ahead of yours buying stock in front of every order that they see coming onto the exchange. It creates price kerfuffles all over the place. And so, yeah, that's my long diatribe on why open outcry is so much better than what the stage of the market that we have now. That was... That was a lot of insight as someone who only knows the electronic side. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's just the way, you know, when you, when you have that, when you have both sides, we have experience on both sides of it from open outcry to electronic trading. It's like, you know, it's like two different worlds. That's crazy. That was cool to hear. Oh uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, you, you spoke about gold earlier and uh, I know, Personally, I don't like gold and silver, but I know that a lot of members and people who follow me uh, are just constantly talking about gold and silver. It's also been really popular on Twitter. Of course, you have these perma bulls and gold and silver. A lot of people saying that they're selling everything and they're just piling into it. Like, do you have any thoughts right now on the current like rare metals market? Yeah, I'd like to know who the seller is. You know, I mean, I, all I read about is that everybody's bullish, you know, precious metals, central banks are huge buyers of precious metals. And I think it's just the mines on the other side that, that are letting them have it, because it seems like given the situation we're in, um, given that we've got kind of persistent inflation, you know, the dollar is 
may not be going down versus other currencies, but it's clearly losing its value, its buying power, right? Um, goods are getting more and more expensive, especially as of late. Um, so I think, I feel like the scenario in my head, I want to know why gold's not at 2,500 already. You know, and we, we keep having this, you know, push towards 22,000, et cetera, and failing. And, you know, you read central banks are record buyers of gold. You know, there's large speculators buying gold. Physical markets are, you know, trading above um, coin prices or, pay, you know, trading a premium to, to spot prices and things like that. And you're like, wow, this is these are uh, all the setups for, you know, really secular, persistent gold rally. And gold has been kind of you know, steady, which is fine if uh, you're the investor in it, because that's why I invest in gold is because I like, it. you know, I think the money's going to be there when I come back looking for it in a couple of years. And, you know, within a couple of percent of how much money I left there is likely to be there. Um, so that's how I look at gold as an investment. But yeah, you know, I, I, I see both. I'm very much, I see both sides of the story um, in gold, right? I, I know how to fade the gold bugs, the guys that are perma bulls and think it's going to go up and up and up forever because they believe in the demise of the dollar and crazy shit like that. Um, and I understand the point of the gold bears or the people that don't have much use for it as well, right? If, if, if I have to go reach for my gold coins in my vault, number one, we have a big problem on our hands Right. And then number two, what the hell am I going to do with them? Right. Because they're not fungible at, at when I go to buy to the drugstore to get medicine for my family. Right. They don't take gold coins. So it doesn't do me any good. You know, so that's why I see, you know, in that very disaster scenario that everybody says you got to have physical for the physical doesn't really do you any good. So that's why I see both sides of the gold story. And um, I do love trading it, though. It's probably one of the most active securities that I trade over the course of every year. Gold and gold miners. Really? Do you focus more on the miners rather than just something that provides some cash flow or are you just... No, I, 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 I'm I, a kind of a macro speculative trader. So what I would be doing is trading gold versus GDX or just thinking like I thought just recently that gold stocks were super cheap relative to gold, you know, and so just trading gold stocks from the long side versus where they were technically, you know, this little bounce that GDX had off its 200 day was a great trade for me, even though it didn't go very far. I was pretty loaded up because um, I believe that they were really, really oversold across a number of technical spectrums that I had. And so that's kind of the way that I'm looking at that. I'm not investing in individual miners. You know, I'm kind of looking at them as very pure gold as a commodity and the sector as the sector that belongs to that commodity. Would you, would you be, so as a long-term holder though, when you're entering in that space, uh, you're just, you're just purely looking as like, this is just somewhere to dump my cash for when I want it later, rather than just holding the dollar. Well, yeah, you know, it's kind of the thing that, you know, at the end of the year, if you're going to kind of divvy up, you know, um, you know, whatever, whatever money you have left over to figure out, you know, where you're going to place it and you're going to, you know, make an alley, some allocation to physical gold every year. You know, is something that I've been kind of a proponent of in some kind of capacity, whether it's, you know, big or small. But that's the kind of money that I feel like is is a much more a much safer savings account than a savings account. You know, quite honestly, you know, because you have total control of it and possession of it and things like that. So I, that's why I'm kind of a believer in that. OK, so would you would you call yourself kind of like a permable as well in that space? You kind of subscribe to that? Well, I'm not necessarily bullish the price. I buy it because I think yeah. that it's a uh, good insurance to have good, certainly good monetary, certainly good currency insurance, right? Okay. If, you know, if you're, if you're worried about, you know, um, you know, it's still a good insurance policy against fiscal irresponsibility, yeah. right? In, in my opinion. So if, you know, if you think that your central bank is being extremely irresponsible, I think that gold is a good thing to own. Because I think that at some point that the dollar does get really whacked versus the field of other dumpster currencies, you know, I think the price of gold will either hang in or go up, you know, and, and my guess is that it's probably going to go up, believe it or not. So, you know, that's why I'm okay with having that. So it's kind of, it's, I don't, I don't, you know, the, the, the money that I put into physical gold is, you know, kind of uh, burying your bones, you know, for another day and and uh, kind of just putting money away in a different form rather than savings. I don't want to have to go chase a bank down for my money at some point one day, too. And that doesn't look like 
this is a completely outrageous thought either. So, I mean, if, if we're talking about fiscal irresponsibility, I feel like I'm almost obliged to also enter Bitcoin into the conversation as well, as many people view it as like a, a gold, the digital gold substitute. Do you have any, do you have any, I think you've spoke about it before. I've heard you speak about it before, but have your opinions changed at all? Uh, no, I think Bitcoin's pretty cool. I think it's a good instrument to have, a new instrument to have in the macro portfolio of sort of currency commodities. You know, I think it's trying to figure out what sort of personality it's going to have. You know, it's not exactly one-to-one -one correlated with anything that I can see. And you can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in it. I just have my own view of it. Um, it got, I love the, I love the sentimental signals that it sends off as a trading vehicle. I mean, it's unbelievable. If everything had sentiment signals like that, I'd be rich. You know, like <laughs> little, you know, I'm serious, like laser eyes. You know what I mean? Like the, the day I, I started seeing this repeated thing on my on my Twitter feed, and I, I love Twitter, and so I'm always on FinTwit. I'm, and I'm questioning, I, I, for a while, I didn't know what it was. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see a whole, everybody's got the laser eyes, right? And you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I had it. And I had, I was like, what the fuck is going on? And I literally had to ask somebody that was into it. And I was like, what is this all about? And it's like, oh, you know, we're going 100,000 and this is what they see. And I'm like, oh, so the rally's over, right? And my buddy was like, what? what are you crazy? <laughs> like, this thing is going to the moon. Like, are you not watching this? And I was like, well, it's not going to the moon anymore. I was like, all these guys that are into all this thing, they think, you know, now, now everybody's looking. So that just stands out as extreme greed. Right. Like these guys have got it all on. They're getting rich. They're, they're, you know, they're chest out and they're, you know, behaving irrationally. And so it was just a matter of time before the price caved in. And, and there's also some really, uh, I, I, I follow another guy that's a local kid here on, um, on, on social media. And he's a friend of mine. We both went to Cornell University about, and 25, 30 years apart or something like that. And he is a, uh, he's an all American wrestler. He's a super, super resourceful kid. And he was long Bitcoin for this whole run. And while the laser eye thing was out and I was like, okay, I'm bearish Bitcoin now because it's going to go down to everybody's, you know, sentiments blown out while this happened, this, this kid went into New York city, bought a Rolex with Bitcoin and put that on his Instagram story, right? Like, yo, yo, this yeah. is me. I just got rich. I got so much Bitcoin. I'm in New York city. I'm checking out, I'm buying a Rolex. I'm paying in Bitcoin. And I literally sent him a message to that exact thing. And I was like, dude, this thing is so going down. You have no idea. And he was the same way. He was like, why bro? Like, are you crazy? You know, cause he's a young guy. And I was like, I'm, you guys will see. Like, I don't know if it's now or a year from now, but they ain't going up anymore. And it was just good today. Like I've seen that play out in so many other markets and so many other ways that it's so much more obscure. Like I lived through the dot-com bubble, you know, and I remember walking into bars and all you heard were conversations about tech stocks. That was a real thing, you know? And so like, this was the closest thing I ever saw to that. And so that's why those, like, like if I was a bigger trader, like if that was oil and those signals came out, like I would only need one of those trades, man. You know, but it was something that I wasn't familiar with. So literally all I did was say, okay, that was, I was actually just bullish because technically it looks so good. I'm no longer bullish. It's not going up anymore. So that's, that, that's where I, uh, that's kind of how I look at cryptocurrency. I do believe that it's, um, you know, I love the fact that it's, you know, not governed by any body or bank or anything like that. It, it's something that I have a small um, position slash interest in a rooting interest in, in in Bitcoin and Ethereum just because I think they're going to be around. I don't know that the price necessarily has to go up for them to become more ubiquitous, you know. Um, so that's another one of my views. But I think it's a great trading vehicle, and I, I kind of welcome it to the macro landscape. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people have been using it as like a, a liquidity signal of like how much extra money is like sloshing around, and it's like. Totally, totally. I mean, that was a great, that was the one, you know, great correlation when they were pouring liquidity into the system, like the thing was going batshit, you know, I have not seen yeah. things trade like that. So that was really cool to see. It's also been, I think, a, a, 
a lot of people are trying to correlate to tech. If Bitcoin was going off, they're looking at tech. And I kind of just want to use that to transition to ask, like, what are your thoughts right now? See, we're seeing today was pretty aggressive downside move suddenly. So lots of people complaining about it on Twitter, asking if there was news or something that caused uh, these big sell-offs in the market right now. Does this seem like a, just a technical move to you? Or you think this is the turnover for tech? Or is this how much are you really paying attention to this space or your eyes on those rare metals and energy right now? Yeah, so it's good, great questions because this is exactly what I do and, and and like what I live and breathe and wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, <laughs> quite honestly. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, I think, first of all, we're in a bull market in, in equities, right? Like, like I'm not, I'm not a disaster guy. I'm not a doomsday guy. And when I talk about stocks pulling back, I talk about them within pulling, like where I will now, within the context of a bull market. Right. I'm not one of those guys that's going to say the S&P is going to go down, man. It's going to get halved. Until, you know, like that's nonsense. You don't make any money with that idea. Zero. Right. So you have to get into the mode of what the market's doing and let the market tell you what it's doing. And that's kind of how I run my practice here and why people subscribe to me, um, because I've gotten good at that and sort of having no ego and I don't marry any views and I might be bullish today and bearish tomorrow, but I have gotten better at finding out where the market's going by listening and not having my own opinion, you know, just kind of taking market signals and saying, Oh, I recognize that. Right. That's going up several, you know, four days out of five that's gaining on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. This is a bull market, right. You know, so that's how I look at it. So what's going on now is we've gotten to uh, we're getting through this point where AI is becoming religion. Right. Artificial intelligence is the new is the new Jesus and people are willing to pay anything for Jesus. And so everybody's first move into AI is just when NVIDIA came out with that headline that sent the stock to four hundred dollars. You know, that was everybody like, oh, this is a bet we have to have on. Right. And at whatever price we get it on, this bet's got to be on. So we just lived through that where there was really very little price discrimination in terms of where people were getting into the AI trade, which just blew valuations out to the moon. And we are at a point where the VIX is depressed, right? So volatility has been depressed to the low teens, which is a low for the year. We're at a point where, um, the AAII bull index is all the way up to 50. So the market is extremely bullish. CNN fear and greed is pinned to extreme greed right now because we're, you know, these markets have been going up and rallying and it's easy to make money being long technology again. So we're at the point where sentiment is totally lopsided, right? And, and stocks have to pull back. So what did we get today? We got a really good signal in the S&P today. We had an outside reversal day down in the S&P. We had a reversal day up in the VIX. We did not have a reversal in the Qs or the NASDAQ. So I don't get too bearish tech. And with the way that I'm playing this as a trader is I'm not even bothering getting short, right? It may, I think it's going down and I think that's nice and I think it's great, but I'm more interested in buying dip because while we go through this AI religion, there's several phases of it. Right now, we're going to have the phase of the last in, first out, and it's going to pull back into some trend line support. Right. And that's kind of what I do for a living is I try to find the securities that are trading from the bottom left of my screen to the top right. And I try to pick out times that I can get in there and participate in that trend from the long side with the best risk management tactics I can apply. Right. So that's what's going on in tech right now. I think that it's just overbought. You know, on several different technical readings, it's overbought like stochastics and RSI and things like that. Like this rally is running out of steam because that's a real market dynamic. Eventually it gets over its skis and you see it pull back into trend. But for me, this is like, I want to be the buyer on the way down. And if I try to get cute and get short into this to try to buy it on the dip, it just screws up my thinking on my timing of the bottom, right? Because for me, trading from the short side is 10 times harder. So I don't really want to do that on this. I want to concentrate on getting into this bull market. I'm extremely bullish on commodities and basic materials. Once again, for the first time in a while, I mean, the oil market has just done something pretty special in the last month, I would say. It's tightened up considerably. Gasoline's had a big leadership role in that rally 
WTI is back up to eighty dollars. It's breaking through moving average resistance levels. So there's a lot going on to be positive about in the oil market. So I'm positive that stuff too. So if I think these commodities are and basic materials are going to come to life now, and maybe tech backs off, how bearish do I need to get in the S and P? You know what I mean? Like, will it back off? Sure, but we're in a bull market. And if now market breadth is getting better and it's not just the seven big tech stocks leading the rally, rather material stocks and financials that are coming back to life, that those are the ingredients of a bull market to me. So when tech goes through this pullback exercise and levels off, it's all going to be in a bull market. You know, so that, that's where I think the S&P can start galloping towards 5K again. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom. So Oh yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was going to ask, um, as far as the AI trend goes right now, do you think it's a long-term trend or do you think it's going to be, you know, kind of a fad, kind of like how Bitcoin was where it exploded on a all or nothing basis and just kind of dropped off and leveled off? That's a really good question. I, I put it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a technical Luddite, so I shouldn't be talking about artificial intelligence at all. I mean, I can barely send email, you know what I mean? But in terms of a market... Um, in terms of the market, I would think, like I said, that there's going to be several phases to this bull market. And I do think that artificial intelligence seems like so complicated and so dynamic, right? What, what it can do across industries, across geography. Across, I mean, it just, it just covers everything and covers everything pretty quickly. So I feel like there's going to be several iterations of it. I feel like there's going to be legal battles that, that you know, it's going to become unconstitutional at some point. We're going to get to the Supreme Court AI case that's going to be a defining moment. Like, I, I think I'm a long, I'd rather position myself as a long-term bull with this. Like, I don't think this is going to be like up in a couple of months and then everything collapses again. I think it's going to be like, you know, everybody's going to figure out how to make their, how to make AI work for them. And then as that sort of makes its way through the markets, we'll see what happens. You know, it doesn't sound like it's bullish employment. You know, it doesn't sound like it's bullish uh, a lot of things. So I, I had fears of it just like everybody else. But in terms from an investment standpoint, it looks kind of like an early phase pioneer market to me. Do you know of anyone? Absolutely. Who, I, I've seen, I agree. And I, uh, do you think, AI is going to have a significant impact on the way markets function. Uh, you know, we've, as it continues to learn and improve, I've played with AI some training chat GPT to trade in the markets, have it trying to identify trends. It's not as good as me, but it, it actually can do some, some stuff as well. I mean, is that something that you've thought about at all or that you've played with or know people who are? Put it this way, I would never say that it's impossible for it to play a big role in trading. Um, I'm unfortunately, I'm unfortunately like an old Clydesdale, you know, that's been galloping around this market for 30 years and I only got maybe 20 left. And I, I, I've already developed my way and form and system of trading. And I still believe it's an art, you know? So if I still believe it's an art, then AI is going to be limited in its application towards spec, towards prop trading. Right, call it that trade. You know, now I'm not talking about, you know, front running electronic trading. I'm talking about prop trading, buying things at one price and selling them at a much higher price, or trying to do things like that. So it could, it could, you know, it could, it could elbow its way into my process somewhere, and maybe it makes my following the markets easier, and that would be great. I keep a number of uh, spreadsheets to follow the markets, and it's a lot of work. It would be great if it was all automated or something like that. Um, but that's how I look at it. Yeah, no, I've I've uh, been playing with Nick carrying some AI assistance as well. For I have one that helps me when I'm doing web page design and stuff like that, but I haven't been able to use it in Excel. But that's a that's actually a great idea. So when you're investing in AI, though, uh, are you mostly looking at uh, the chip producers like Nvidia or maybe Intel or AMD or ones that play into that role, the semiconductor, Taiwan Semiconductor maybe? Or are you also looking at the different service providers like Microsoft or AI technically? What what interests you the most? I'm looking for the action. Right. <laughs> I'm 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 looking for the money. You know what I mean? I don't care if it's AI or if they're trading bananas in the Dominican Republic, right? All I know is that there's gonna be five or six stocks that are gonna be going batshit crazy, right? And and the high volatility is something that I can prey on, you know, having 
you know, and and this isn't tooting my horn, but this is what I do is just saying, you know, having a lot of experience across, you know, different pioneer markets and different bull markets and different nascent young markets, you know, that those opportunities are going to replicate themselves, like you said, in the NVIDIA's and the Intel's and the Microsoft's. And I'm not smart enough to know which of these guys is going to win the battle. I'm just here to be in the market trading in stocks. You know what I mean? Like if, if if we said tomorrow that we're going to go to nuclear reactors, right? Like the nuclear stocks, the, the uranium stocks would all go batshit crazy. And I trade them because they're going to start exhibiting this, you know, new high volatility behavior that I know how to prey on. You know what I mean? So I'm excited about AI, not because it's AI, because these five stocks are going to go batshit crazy for the next five years. Yeah. That's so you're not looking at the long-term buy and hold. You're looking at the volatility, how can you make the couple of bucks, you know, on the different waves? Yeah. And it's not even, not, not even as much as, I mean, not, not necessarily just a couple of bucks. Like I, I'm willing to or, kill yeah. it on one of the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, and, and it'll be, you know, getting to know how that company react, how that company reacts to AI, you know, as they go, you know, and so there'll be an education for me in artificial intelligence and maybe I'll stay long something. Right. And maybe I'll decide, you know what, for the kids accounts, let's put, Five thousand dollars each of this stock in there because I just learned that they're you know one of the young and up and coming blah blah blahs and I think in twenty five years, you know they're really going to be having a good time at this. So that may be something where it plays into, you know, a longer term investment. Um, I, I've done a lot of things like that, you know, where you where you start off playing where the volatility is and wind up saying, oh, I think I picked a winner here, you know. So. That does all come together like that for sure. But I'm I'm like, that's why I'm excited about it. It's truly for the rise of volatility and uncertainty in the markets. That that just creates a lot of easy money opportunities for a trader. When you're talking about the young and upcoming, but later on might explode, has anything stood out to you? I've done a I've done a lot of digging and it's it's been some of the quantum companies stand out, but I'm curious to know if anything has stood out to you. No, I be honest with you, and that's not my um, that's not like my lane, and, and like I'm not an individual stock picker and stock mm -hmm. studier. Like I, I love macro markets, and I love, you know, seeing how those headlines, you know, affect markets. I'm not, I don't know how to pick stocks. I always say stocks pick me. Mm -hmm. um, like when I learn about a company that I think is a cool company, I look up the stock, you know, like the, and see if it's worth trading or investing and. I was super early to Yeti. Like I inhaled that thing when it went public. I was on the Peloton train because I have a Peloton bike and treadmill right over here. And I was like, oh, people are going to love this thing, or at least they're going to love the stock. So that's kind of how I fall into either investing or trading an individual name. Otherwise, you know, I, I'm I'm like I'm more looking for the two weeks that I want to be max long energy stocks and make twenty percent on, you know, like that. That's the stuff that I'm hunting down. So, what are you? What are if we look at the energy market as a whole? Then, uh, what are you? What are you most bullish on right now? Like, what what is standing? Is it the just recent you know improvement in oil? So was W two I well, hitting highs or? Yeah, that's kind of exciting, you know, that this is a story that I've been in for a while. I, I had, we were long oil for the run. We were long oil, by the way, from $15. Like I had, I had, um, I mean, I'm on the tape as making the call and to when the lockdown happened and you remember when the oil price went essentially to zero yeah. almost. Dead I mean, in the water. I, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, everything stopped. Everybody's oil bars just got backed up. The price went down. You know, the prices crashed. Futures prices crashed. And um, I mean, I was a raging bull for the the entire time from the way down from, from 20 down to zero back up to 75, 80. I was still bullish. And then, then we had the Russian response to the NATO invasion of Ukraine. Oil traded up to $130 and we sold our position right into that rally and said, okay, we're flat. So we bought the lockdown lows at 20 bucks and we sold it at 120 bucks and that was a great trade, right? So I'm, I am deeply invested in the move of the oil market. 
I've been sitting here waiting for it to pull back to a level that I think it's worth being long again. And for the first time in months, it feels like we're there. So I'm now engaged on long oil and oil stocks. Um, what's going on now is there's been super tightening in the gasoline market in the last month, essentially. The front month spread went from 15 cents to 27 cents in the same month, which is like an enormous move. Or I guess it happened over the course of two months, but that was an enormous move. Um, it's happening because there are basically low gasoline inventories. Demand is fairly static and the economy is a lot stronger than most economists have on their pad. So we just got this super tightening effect in the gasoline market and it picked up in the WTI market, which crude oil you know, rallied as well. And so now crude oil is taking out some moving average resistance levels. Technically speaking, it's starting to look really good. Now, the exciting part of the story is that the real reason that oil was so depressed for the last two years is because Joe Biden has been dumping our strategic petroleum reserve into the open market, right, to try to keep gas prices down. Totally political move, right? He's out of yeah, he's oil out of sell. oil to sell. Yeah, he's, he's he's out of oil to sell. There's no more SPR to sell. He's got to buy it back now if he wants to refill it. I'm pretty confident that Saudi Arabia doesn't want to give him a good chance to refill it, so they've cut production, right? Now Biden doesn't have any more SPR to lean on to sell. And so there may be one mine, one large seller that is out of the market now. And if OPEC decides to tighten production for another, for whatever reason they decide to, now we're talking about $90 oil again. Nobody knows where it's going from there. So that's why to me, like, you know, that now we've got a loaded bet where the odds are stacked against you on the downside. You know, especially after what's happened technically and what's gone on politically, it's like, oh, man, if you're betting on the down, you know, now we've got no recession happening either with today's GDP print was unbelievable. Now, if you're betting on the downside in oil, you're screwed. Right. So when, so when you're when you're looking at so when you're looking at oil, you mentioned oil companies or do you liking producers like Devon Energy or are you looking more at like conglomerates like? XOM or yeah, I'm looking at the big ones. I think they're best yeah. positioned because they're 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 um you know they're playing both sides of the ball now while the Biden administration has gone forward with all the carbon capture, they went into the carbon capture and storage business. Right. That's literally a new vertical at ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Conoco is working on it as well. So those are the companies that are set up to do the best in any kind of scenario, you know, the most highly capitalized and those are the ones where those are the ones leading the market right now. Now, there's also there are situations where we just had another trade on our books for almost a year. We were long refiners, um, Marathon Petroleum, Valero, names like that, because the crack spread blew out from fifteen dollars to forty five dollars. That's essentially the price that a refiner gets paid to crack three barrels of oil into two barrels of diesel fuel and one barrel of jet fuel. Right, so their margin expanded from 15 bucks to 45 bucks and the stocks did nothing at first, right? So it was like, these stocks are absurdly cheap here. The market doesn't even, you know, hasn't even really. And then they went on a big, huge run. Marathon Petroleum went from about 35 to 130. And uh, we, we caught that move really, really well too, thanks to the telegraphing that we saw in the oil market. And so it's sometimes, it, it depends on what side of the market you're going for. Like, broadly speaking, when it's just an oil rally, the big EMP companies are kind of the best to own. And sometimes you have a situation where it's just the refiners that are set up to really, really soar. And they still are set up to do pretty well. So we'll see if they continue, but it depends. Okay. So I, yeah, I, I, that was good. We're, we're uh, getting a little short of time. So I also want to pivot. I want to make sure we talk about a little bit of Nat gas. Some of your thoughts on Nat gas right now with a lot of politics going on there as well. Europe this winter is any of that on your mind right now at the moment as well or is the price action not there and you're just not giving it time right yeah now? exactly it's not um it's not exciting right now the the market feels pretty balanced we had a situation where you know last winter was exciting um you know Europe there we had they had massive shortages of supplies and you know in trying to recoup that and while the market was rallying during a cold weather spell, they were trying to cover their short. And so Dutch TTF natural gas went to, you know, hundred euro per megawatt hour, which, uh, yeah, hundred euro per megawatt hour, exactly. Um, 
which is an absurd price, you know, a total just spike in the price of natural gas. And it took, it took, you know, absurdly warm weather and tons of stimulus money from the ECB to, you know, sort of get them back together again. And the market looked at that as like, oh, that was that, that went fine. You know, they got themselves out of that mess, you know? And so the thing that's worth keeping an eye on now is that Dutch TTF prices have come all the way back to like two euro per megawatt hour. Um, back from where they started, the price is just sidelined. So I was just, excuse me, flatlined at, you know, depressed levels. And that's when everybody forgets about it. And everybody says, oh, we can just move on from that issue here. But the reality is, is that Europe is still, you know, pressuring, I mean, cutting down on drilling for gas and oil, just like we are over here. So they're not solving the problem in any way. They're just sort of saying, okay, we're covered now because we have enough in storage. Now they have enough in storage for a normal winter, but if we have a cold winter again this year, they don't have enough natural gas. So then there'll be another price spike there. So that's going to be something that I have an eye on, like kind of waiting to see if that does happen. So for me as a trader, that that that's the thing that shakes the price up that would get me to, you know, trade some of, you know, maybe some more natural gas stocks here and stuff like that. I usually stay on the U.S. continent. I don't really like trading international names or anything like that. Yeah. So, uh, but as a trader, you can still trade the natural gas and trade the spreads that are always reacting to that. And so there's opportunity there. Um, the liquid natural gas story is, a, is you know, popular. That's obviously going to be something that closes the global arb, you know, when we can effectively ship natural gas across the pond um, in large quantities. And that's something that's being worked on. And that'll kind of close up the global arbs to be a lot tighter um, and a great development for the market because we'll be able to cover shortages easier, you know, geographically with the use of waterway you know, rather than have to pipeline everything where it has to go. So that's a fun thing to kind of follow. Um, but other than that, there's not really a great trading opportunity that I see other than, you know, maybe just being a passive long investor here, you know, expecting something crazy to happen. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense to me. And speaking of like the political issues of like, you know, everyone's tightened restrictions. It seems like everyone is also writing off what seems to be most obviously the best all energy uh, process right now, which is uranium and nuclear energy. And I've been, I mean, I've been bullish here for years now after doing a bunch of research and the supply chains there being so complex. Like, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy right now? I do agree that it's going to be the necessary fallback at some point, especially if we, you know, go as hard as we're trying to go towards, you know, electronic vehicles and, and electronic battery power. I mean, we know that's going to take a lot of fossil fuel to get to. Um, but we don't know how efficient it's going to be, you know, so I think that eventually that that I, eventually I think that there is a total comeuppance of this whole, you know, push towards electric power, battery power and push toward intermittent power um, where they become just an absolute failure and, and something that societies won't allow themselves to rely on. You know, because, they'll be, you know, when, once things go and start relying on more wind and solar there'll be some kind of a peaceful period and then there'll be a complete natural disaster that happens where people are out of power for so long that people die, you know, and that'll be sort of the end of the, okay, that's the end of the green movement. You know, let's, uh, let, let's start working on survival first and then we'll worry about, you know, how much carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. So I think that that whole climate hoax is going to get turned over. And then I think that one day will that the cooler heads may prevail and we'll we'll pivot towards nuclear energy. And I, while I think that'll be good for this for you know for our power generation and for society, I don't know that necessarily means that the price of uranium has to go up either. You know, if we're going to go to nuclear power, then we're going to need more people to produce uranium, which means there's going to be a bigger, broader, more robust market for it. And so, why does the price have to just go up and up and up forever? You know, I believe in that the stocks would be great stocks to own. Um, Amico, obviously, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm generally a, a uranium bull. I'm trying to stay uranium bull. It's just that it's a, it's a sort of very, it's a glacial speed moving trade. So that's why it's also something that's not that exciting for me. Yeah. Well, there's a few things that I like to double click on there, but uh, I guess if, if you're not, I, I would agree with you that the price of uranium this might not actually go up just because there's more people getting participate uh, participating. But would would that would that cause you to take a 
deeper look at maybe some of the utility companies and see that as an opportunity then as they they will likely benefit yeah yeah they'll they'll all get shaken up if we start moving towards nuclear right i mean they'll, they'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that they, they, they'll still be the hot stocks to trade and and they may, there may be a revolution in that process right where where you know which one of these companies becomes maybe one one maybe one utility becomes the master of nuclear and that's all you need right um yeah. or something like that or uh you know so that you know, there could be that. That's certainly a you know another pioneer revolutionary market that I'd love to chase down. You know when it happens. And for now, it's just worth keeping an eye on and staying semi-educated, I guess. Yeah, right now ECG is what I'm looking at. But I also want to double click on what you said for um for what you think will actually cause the the uh, environmental cultists to actually turn ship and realize that nuclear is the best path will actually take something catastrophic and the clean energy sources to actually fail. Do you, is that really, is that like what you're thinking it's going to take for them to actually, uh, you know, I mean, jump off the ships right now. I'm, I, yeah, man. I mean, it's yeah, not catastrophic, we, but it, it actually makes a lot of sense to me, unfortunately, even though I don't. Like yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, we got somebody, John Kerry is not going to be stopped. Right. Yeah, no, right. nobody's stopping him. Nobody's stopping him. Right. So he is going around with his pedal to the metal on the globalist plan for carbon emissions. Right. 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 There, you know, there he's 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 threatening here in the US. Right. He's making comments all over the world in his private jet, and he's threatening that now that agriculture is too big a part of our carbon emissions. Now, how long, how long do you think that he is going to be able to pull that joke off on 342 million Americans? You know what I mean? How long before they're like, wait a minute, dude, you're talking about our effing food supply. Right. You know what I mean? So can we just talk about, you know, nutrient, you know, nutrients coming first, right? Like the food that we eat has got to get some kind of a precedent so that you know that's why we're having all this cricket bullshit and all this you know even there was just an article on on Reuters how in Japan you know they're moving towards a lot more insect based diet and it's like give me a break you know like what garbage there's nobody looking to move towards an insect diet you know yeah. um so that's my point is that you know they've, they've got to try to pull this gigantic thing off on the world while the world's eyes are wide open you know, they're, they're over in Belgium. They're like, OK, farmers, you guys are closed and you can't be in farming again. And we're going to take the farms from you. And they're like, what? You know what I mean? Like they, they literally they just tried to pull that off. And now, you know, all the, the farmers are all protesting. Same thing is happening, um, I guess, in Ireland and potentially in the UK. So, I you know, I just feel like they're pushing so hard on society that eventually it's, it's just not going to work. Right. Yeah. People are just not going to be OK with, oh, OK, no more red meat. Got it. You know, OK, just so we can save the planet, because that's that's a real thing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so that, that's, you know, I just feel like that. So eventually there's just going to be pushing so hard to be like, OK, now you have no more gas burner. Um, now you can't take a hot shower. You can't. Boil, and, the, and the whole, you know, that's not going to win any votes. People don't vote for that. Right. They vote for the guy that's going to be like. I'm a gas stove guy. I'm in fossil yeah. fuels. I'm a drill baby drill guy. You know, God, vote for that guy. You know, this yeah. guy lets me put my air conditioner back on. How many votes is he going to get? Yeah. Right. So that, you know, that's where the pendulum will be like, yeah, it's enough green for us. Okay. While well, we'll swing back the other way, you know, and it takes forever though, as you can see, you know, I don't know when this is going to happen, but it takes forever. It's, so. it's, it's actually extremely frustrating to just watch it all just veer so far in the wrong way, especially since I, I was looking at like UK estimates for starvation and who knows how far off those actually are from how bad it gets because the politics that start to play out once you start restrict, once people start starving and the governments will hog the food. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's a disaster. Yeah, That's revolution waiting. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's pitchforks, man pitchforks and torches people are not they're not going to go for it they're not going to go for it so you know and then and then you know so then you hopefully you say okay we get back to fossil fuels and then you know maybe the maybe you know people like doomberg do enough um 
socialization of the fact that, you know, the fact that nuclear waste can't be cleaned up is a total fallacy, right? It's something that's totally pushed by the environmentalists. It's a total lie. You know, like nuclear waste is as, you know, disposable as any waste on the planet. It is as containable and less dangerous than a lot of chemical waste. So you're like, wow, you know, I mean, if the world ever learns this, maybe we'll learn towards you move towards using it, you know, because of its wild efficiency. Right. And if you if you, you know, my idea was always just if you use it and, you know, really somebody revolutionizes how to protect it, then we can all, you know, then we can all benefit from that. So hopefully that that, that happens in my lifetime. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, hopefully I did. The, the it should happen in yours. Yeah. It's, it'd be exciting. I, I mean, the general population is still so far off base. I put out a lot of TikTok content and I did, uh, uh, I still do a lot of shorts about uranium and the benefits and uh, the positives and how much better it is compared to other clean energy sources. And the comments I get look like they're straight out of the seventies where it's just, yeah. people just do not understand at all how much this technology has improved. Apparently all other technology has improved over the course of 50 years, but apparently that one suddenly somehow hasn't. So it's, yeah, it's actually yeah. wild. And then yeah. people have all seen Chernobyl on HBO, which was a yes. tremendous movie, you know, and they're, you know, all that stuff plays into it. It, it just, people are just like, no, that's what nuclear is, you know, yeah. and that, that's, that's all, that's all they know. <laughs> so yeah, it's crazy. As long yeah. as Iran doesn't fuck it all up, we should be fine. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Oh, man. Awesome. Well, I mean, it was fantastic uh, to talk to you, Tony. Uh, of course, I'm going to include uh, on YouTube uh, a link down in the description uh, for the navigator uh, and some of your socials as well. I know I've already shared your Twitter and the Discord told everyone to give you a follow because you do some great call outs on Discord. I, met, I remember before this tech rally came out, you like posted a bunch of charts like this company, that company. Those were some great yeah. calls as well. So make sure everyone gives uh, Tony Greer a follow over on Twitter. Uh, check out the Navigator. Monty, any any last questions or comments you want to give as well um, before we for wrap things up? Give Tony. A oh yeah, since we have a minute to go, you know what was your choice of music for today during today's market action? I know you're a big music buff and listen to all your podcast deals yeah, and stuff I like that. You know. <laughs> Great call because I always I always do have something lasting here when I'm not on a call because it's like the like you know calls call I mean you guys know call calls are tiring right it's it's work to stay focused and and like after that and you know you need a release or something so I was today um, unfortunately not very um, interestingly I was interested I was listening to last night's fish show at the Man theater in philadelphia because they had just they had just played there two nights and they open at the garden tomorrow night um so i was just anxious to see like kind of what they closed up in philly with before they play seven nights at madison square garden so that's what i was listening to today and it was amazing and i'm psyched to see them at msg that's all right cool. yeah yeah awesome well that i think we'll go ahead and call that appreciate you again tony thanks for coming out today yeah, thanks for having me. You guys put on a great podcast. You asked great questions. I was honored to be here. Thanks for giving me a platform. And if I can help you guys out in any way, please just don't hesitate to reach out. Hey, I really appreciate that. And hopefully we'll have you on in the future. Uh, again. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Say the word. Awesome. awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Tony. You have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Hey, Thank you guys care. so much. Yeah. Right on. Nice, nice to meet you. We'll talk again for sure.